Welcome. Welcome to the 2016 Symposium on Religious Liberty. My name is Andrew Bibby. I'm the Interim Director of the Center for Constitutional Studies. I'll be brief uh, for two reasons. One, I want you to have as much time as possible with our uh, keynote speaker tonight, Ross Dalfin. The second, I see some of my students in the audience, and you've seen enough of me this year and heard enough of me, so we'll try to keep this brief. If you look at your program, the title of tonight's address is All Mormons Now, with a question mark. The Religious Liberty Debate's 19th Century Future. Please join us in welcoming Ross Douthat. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I've turned it on. Can everyone hear me? Excellent. Um, thank you so much for that very kind introduction. Um, thanks to the Center for Constitutional Studies, the Center for Mormon Studies, the entire university, and all of you fine people for being here tonight. Uh, and it's always a particular pleasure to speak as a journalist at the opening of a conference where most of the speakers are very serious academics, because I can be assured that whatever historical errors and misrepresentations I offer you tonight will be corrected by serious people at the conference tomorrow. So please do come back and learn the real truth about all the topics that I have in a journalistic way sort of glanced and glazed over this evening. Um, so yes, the title of my talk is All Mormons Now. And actually, I'm going to spend the bulk of the time talking about how mass conversions to the Church of Jesus Christ and the Latter-day Saints will transform the American religious liberty debate over the next 50 years, because once the country is 75% Mormon, obviously all kinds of political realities will shift in different ways and so on, um, and we'll be, no, that's not, that's not actually what I'm going to say. So, <laughs> but maybe if I come back in five years' time and I've looked at some demographic data, I can, I can give that talk instead. Um, but Mormon missionaries, you'll have to up your game a little bit to get us to that point. Uh, so, no, I'm going to talk about... Um, basically sort of the history of religious liberty debates in the United States and the sort of strange and interesting ways that we're recapitulating some of the, the debates that we had in the 19th century around Mormonism and also my own faith, Catholicism, in the contemporary landscape. Um, and yes, the sort of very interesting ways that that's playing out. But I, I thought I'd start by sort of talking about two stories that we tell about religious liberty in the United States. The um, simple story, I guess you could say, and the more complicated story. And they're both true stories. Uh, but the simple story is the kind of high school civics class, I mean, depending on what your high school civics class teaches nowadays, but we'll call it the high school civics class, sort of, you know, a positive, upbeat story about America as a haven for religious liberty. America's you know, the America, America is founded, the first colonists are religious dissenters seeking liberty, and we'll sort of gloss over the people in Jamestown who are seeking something else. Um, and, going, and going back to the colonial era and the founding of, of the republic and so on, you have basically a story of America as a uniquely good place to practice just about any religion. Um, we're a country that's never had an established church. Some of the early colonies did, but the Republic as a whole has never had one. We don't have any of the weight of the kind of debates and complicated, often bloody history that European countries have around struggles between church and state and so on. And we have a long and flourishing history of religious competition, religious diversity, constant religious revivals, sort of churches springing up and growing stale and ossified and new religions springing up to take their place. Um, as, as was mentioned, the title of my last book was How We Became a Nation of Heretics. And that book was sort of a critical look at um, heresies of American Christianity, but it was also one that acknowledged the essentially the deeply positive side of having a nation in which, in a sense, everybody's a heretic, right? Because there's no established church, because there's no clear definition of what it, you know, what it means to be a good American and a religious believer at the same time, you can let a hundred or a hundred thousand flowers bloom. So it's not just that you have mainline Protestantism and Catholicism, it's that you have countless religious startups 
countless new faiths coming into existence across the 18th, 19th, and 20th century, and the fact that I'm delivering this talk in the state of Utah, a state that was itself founded by um, adherents of a religious startup from the 19th century that became one of the most important religious traditions in America today, is itself a testimony to the power of religious freedom in American history and the power of having a country where sort of anything seems possible religiously to lead to really amazing things. But at the same time, that sort of purely positive story also has to be complicated by the fact that, you know, the Mormon settlers of Utah ended up here because they were in fact persecuted across the length and breadth of the United States in the 19th century. They wouldn't have ended up here um, and they wouldn't have the inspiring story of sort of westward migration to tell if the entirety of the United States in that era had been perfectly comfortable with religious liberty in all its forms. And in fact, it wasn't for the very good reason that the United States, our tradition of religious liberty is a tradition that comes out of a specifically Protestant heritage. Um, it goes back to 17th century debates in England where the important thing was to figure out an understanding of religious liberty that would let you have religious liberty for Anglicans and for Calvinists, but would let you exclude Catholics because Catholics were dangerous. And there were very good reasons for people in 17th century England to think that Catholics were dangerous because it wasn't so long ago that a very large armada, you know, crewed by Spanish Catholics had attempted to conquer and subjugate England. Uh, so it, this, w this wasn't an unreasonable feeling that inspired everyone from John Milton to John Locke to basically come up with understandings of religious freedom that would exclude or limit the religious rights of Catholics. But that's still an important part of the story of religious liberty as it was understood by English-speaking Protestants in 18th century America. And that understanding had sort of two implications for then 19th century debates about religious liberty. One of those implications was that a sort of Protestant understanding of morality and ethics governed the practical moral and ethical limits of what people understood by religious liberty in 19th century America. And this was where Mormonism ran into trouble, because primarily because of the issue of polygamy, which was seen by 19th century Protestants as something that was not protected by the First Amendment, something that was not protected by religious liberty, something that was, in fact, as the original Republican Party platform put it, a relic of barbarism that a modern society needed to treat with extreme prejudice. Um, so you had that sort of Protestant moral consensus that placed certain religious ideas and certain religious practices, Mormon polygamy chief among them, beyond the pale of religious liberty. And then more broadly, you had the same sense of liberalism's boundaries that you'd had in certain ways in 17th century England. You had the idea, basically, again, the understandable idea, I think, that religious traditions could only participate fully in the religious liberty afforded by the United States insofar as they uh, your is not very good for recording, so can you turn that mic off? Yes, sense? I can. I always prefer the sort of talk show host thing anyway, because that's why I can go halfway up the aisle. And, I mean, you can be the talk show host or the revivalist, in fact, if we're, if we're really going to get exciting. Um, but anyway, so as, as I was saying, you have this, this understanding that religious liberty only extends insofar as your religious tradition is itself compatible with liberalism. Um, and this was the problem, arguably, for... Catholics in 17th century England, that they were loyal to a foreign power, loyal to the Pope, and also probably connected to, um, you know, Spanish or French imperial designs, and therefore their liberties only extended so far as, um, as, they, are, as they were willing to, to essentially promise not to be slavishly obedient to the Pope, right? And the same thing was true in 19th century debates in the United States. In that period, um, the Vatican was engaged in extended noisy arguments about liberalism and Catholicism and the compatibility thereof, in which successive popes basically said that, uh, you know, that Catholicism and liberalism were enemies. And understandably, they, they were enemies in 19th century Italy um, and 19th century Germany and 19th century France and so on down the list of European countries. But what this meant for American debates was that there was a large and vocal 
Protestant perspective that said basically that Catholics, in order to become fully American, needed to cease to be Catholics or Catholicism itself needed to be transformed. Um, and speaking as a Catholic, obviously this, you know, this argument was shot through with various forms of anti-Catholic bigotry and, uh, you know, sort of racism and contempt for Irish and Italians, but it was also shot through with a not unreasonable understanding of what the popes were about, what Catholicism was about, and what religious believers needed to do to be at home in a liberal democratic republic like the United States. And again, to some extent, this also extended to the debate surrounding Mormonism because it wasn't just polygamy that was an issue in the middle and later part of the 19th century. It was also debates about the governmental structure of Utah, the extent to which, uh, to which Mormonism tended towards theocracy, and so on. So you had parallels, not perfect, but some, but parallels in the political realm, too, between uh, what, what people who participated in this Protestant consensus perceived as Catholicism's potential incompatibility with American democracy and Mormonism's potential incompatibility with American democracy. And now again, in this, this sort of simpler story that, that people tell, um, these sort of this animus, this anti-Catholic bigotry, this anti-Mormon sentiment, that was just a betrayal of American ideals, and eventually people stopped being bigoted and prejudiced, and eventually anti-Catholicism receded, and eventually, maybe more slowly, anti-Mormon sentiment receded as well. But again, I think the reality is a little more complicated, that actually what happened is that Catholicism changed, um, and Mormonism changed in ways that made them seem less threatening to that Protestant consensus. And in Mormonism, Mormonism has the more extreme example because you literally have the moment where polygamy is, you know, you have a divine revelation, basically, and polygamy is no longer an operating principle um, of the Mormon church, and that coincides with Utah's entry into the Union, um, and it coincides with, uh, in effect, the sort of beginning of the mainstreaming of Mormonism in American society, a process that, as some of the debates around Mitt Romney's campaign suggests, continues to the present day. Um, and then in Catholicism, things happen more gradually, but you have this long period where American Catholic bishops and intellectuals and so on are engaged in this sort of two-sided argument, where they are arguing with their Protestant critics domestically about and saying, no, look, we are patriotic Americans. In fact, we're more patriotic than the average American. American Catholicism in the late 19th and early 20th century is extremely sort of hyper-patriotic, hyper-Americanist in order to sort of prove its patriotic bona fides. And Mormonism does something similar, I think, over, over that same 50 to 70 year period. But at the same time, these American Catholics are also arguing with their own church. They're arguing with Rome. They're arguing with the Vatican. They're arguing with Catholic intellectuals in Europe who took the view, basically, that American Catholicism needed to set as its ultimate goal a, the transformation of the United States into a confessional Catholic state, um, a democratic state, not necessarily sort of Franco-Spain, but still a state in which Catholicism had some sort of recognition as the state religion or you know, something along those lines. That was the official Vatican and the, indeed the official Catholic position for many, many years. And it did change, but it changed in part because of the work of American Catholic intellectuals who were themselves reacting to critiques from their Protestant fellow Americans and so on. So you have this complicated process whereby both Mormonism and Catholicism, it's not, they both sort of justify their own assimilation into American society by changing in ways that resolve some of the dilemmas and criticisms that are hurled their way um, from people who participate in the older Protestant consensus. So it's not just a simple story of bigotry gradually disappearing and Catholicism and Mormonism going mainstream. It's also a case where some of the arguments that we associate with bigots were in fact sort of vindicated by the ways in which both Mormonism and Catholicism changed in order to sort of deal with those, those critics who said that they didn't have a place in American society. So that's sort of the backdrop 
um, that I'm going to use to talk about more contemporary realities. This sort of historical process in which it isn't just that America is a haven for perfect religious liberty and all is sort of sunshine and laughter and religious diversity, but there's a more complicated reality in which there is still an American consensus, historically Protestant, that places some limits on religious liberty. And those limits affect how religious groups that depart from that consensus are constrained, how they're criticized, and how they ultimately change, as Mormonism and Catholicism both did. And sort of how deep those changes really are is a question that we can get into or maybe argue about a little bit in the Q&A. But there's, there's no question that on issues of you know, the Vatican's position on religious liberty, on, you know, on, on a range of issues along those lines, Catholicism did really change between 1860 and 19, 1965, let's say. So that's, that's the backdrop. Now, in the contemporary religious landscape, you have a couple of things going on. One is going on with Islam. And if you look at the debates around religious liberty and Muslim immigration to the US and so on, they often look a lot like some of the debates surrounding Catholic immigration in the United States in the 19th century. Um, you have lots of arguments about whether Islam is actually compatible with liberal democracy. You have lots of arguments about how Islam might need to change in order to be fully at home in the United States. You have arguments about how a Americanized or Westernized Islam might be in dialogue with the rest of the Muslim world, much as American Catholicism was in a kind of dialogue um, with, with the Vatican and European Catholicism in the 19th and early 20th century. And then you have sort of specific flashpoints around um, Sharia law, gender roles, the treatment of women, and so on, that look like specific flashpoints, like the flashpoints around polygamy and Mormonism in the 19th century, where you have specific religious practices and ideas that are seen as incompatible with modern Western society, um, uh, you know, just as, again, the language of relics of barbarism, the language that that sort of Protestant Americans applied to Mormon polygamy in the 19th century could easily be applied by critics of contemporary Islam to things that they're worried about with Muslim immigration to the US. Now, these debates are not as sort of extreme as the debates are that are happening in Europe right now, for instance, um, because in part because American Muslims tend to be more assimilated to American society than European Muslims are to European society, in part because the United States doesn't share a land and sea border with the Islamic world, in part because the sheer numbers of Muslims in the US are not at all like the numbers of Muslims in Europe, and in, indeed the number of Muslims in the US is not at all like the number of Catholic immigrants was in 1895 or so. So this debate is it's happening at sort of a lower boil than it's happening in Europe, and it's happening at a lower boil than the debates about um, Catholicism were happening in the 1880s and 1890s. But it also does tend to um, excite, uh, excite the passions in a more dramatic way because of the role of terrorism. Um, that uh, you, know, you, you do have some links between Catholic immigration and sort of anarchist terrorist cells in the 1890s and the early 1900s. But for the most part, there, as much as there were fears about Catholics infiltrating the US who were secretly loyal to the Pope and so on, there wasn't a widespread anxiety in, say, 1927 that you know, a sort of Catholic version of Al-Qaeda was plotting terror attacks against the US. Although if you read some KKK propaganda from that era, you might have, you might have seen insinuations along those lines. So, so, th so there are some real differences between <coughs> Um, the, debate the debate surrounding Islam, the debate surrounding Catholicism and Mormonism in the, in the 19th century. But there are some clear parallels as well. And you could tell, I think, a plausible story about the next 50 or 100 years of um, sort of Muslim, Muslim American, about both the Muslim American trajectory in the US and about what that might mean for wider currents in Islam around the world, in which basically Islam could follow a kind of Catholic path with some Mormon elements worked in, again, around issues of polygamy, gender roles, and so on, um, where 
Islam would adapt to the US in different ways, anti-Muslim bigotry would recede in various ways, and what happens in it within American Islam would have ripple effects for Islamic communities around the world, potentially, and could, just as what happened in American Catholicism had implications for the Second Vatican Council and the changes that came to global Catholicism from the 1960s on, so the successful assimilation of Muslim Americans could provide a model for changes, transformations, and debates in the global Islamic community. Um, so if you just look at sort of the religious liberty, contemporary religious liberty debates that way, you can see essentially a kind of clear narrative. You have a consensus in the US, it's rooted in Protestantism, but it gradually makes room for groups that are more alien to that consensus, Mormon, Catholic, now Muslim, Jewish worked in as well, and those groups change, the consensus change, uh, changes, and it's sort of an organic but ever more inclusive process, basically, where you know, more and more groups are included within the American definition of religious liberty, and it gets more capacious, America becomes a freer society, a more religiously diverse society, and you have a sort of upward, upward narrative of progress in religious liberty. Um, but what's interesting is that what's happening at the same time is a kind of, I would call it a, a regress, um, where you have groups that were, that were sort of successfully well, they were either part of the Protestant consensus to begin with, or were successfully assimilate, assimilated into that consensus, are now coming to seem like sort of, I guess you could say, resident aliens as that consensus shifts in various ways. And this is basically what's been happening around issues related to sexuality in American life over the last 30 or 35 years, where the working out of the sexual revolution in American life has changed the core nature of the American sort of moral ethical consensus in ways that people did not really expect 70 or 80 or 150 years ago. Um, but what that's meant is that instead of having a kind of Protestant ethical consensus that gradually makes room for Catholics and Mormons and Jews and Muslims, you increasingly have a kind of post-Protestant ethical consensus that takes as givens the sexual revolution in all its different forms and thus is in conflict with the older Protestant ethic, the older Catholic ethic, the older and the newer Mormon ethic, the older Jewish ethic, and the older Muslim ethic. Um, and that's where we are in a lot of the religious liberty debates that we're seeing right now, basically. Um, and that these, these are sort of sharpest around issues related to homosexuality and same-sex marriage, um, but they're also sharp around issues related to abortion, contraception, the whole umbrella that sort of liberalism places under the umbrella of reproductive rights. Basically, on, on all of those issues, there is an emerging consensus that the traditional biblical Judeo-Christian view of sexual morality is itself a relic of barbarism. Um, and that precise language probably wouldn't be used, but the, the sensibility that more and more Americans, especially at the elite level, bring to bear on these debates is a sensibility that sees sort of biblical, New Testament, um, Old Testament, certainly, <laughs> um, views of human sexuality the way a Presbyterian minister in 1853, let's say, might have looked at Mormon polygamy as a sort of view of relations between the sexes, sexual ethics, and so on, that is essentially backward, dangerous, harmful to women, in contemporary debates, harmful to gay people, harmful to transgender people harmful to transgender teenagers, you know, and so on, down the list of groups that are victimized in this, from this perspective by the biblical worldview on human sexuality. Um, and so what that means is that you have this strange state of affairs where groups that once formed 
either formed part of this sort of Protestant core or aspired to join the Protestant core now find themselves increasingly <coughs> alienated from that core. And it, the irony is particularly rich, I think, for, for uh, Mormons themselves because essentially Mormonism spent a great deal of time and energy adapting itself to um, a, the sort of 19th century Protestant view of marriage and basically sort of pushing polygamy away, um, pushing polygamous communities to the margins of the greater Mormon community. And by the time the 1950s rolled around, there was no community in the United States that was sort of more classically American in its orientation towards family and family values um, than Latter-day Saints. And, but over the next 50 or 60 years, basically Mormons stayed where they were, you know, allowing for change and development and so on, but basically stayed where they were. And American society moved in a completely different direction. Um, so Mormons had basically accommodated themselves to a cultural consensus that then ceased to exist and left Mormons as aliens once again, in various ways, joined, of course, by conservative Catholics, conservative evangelicals, conservative Jews, and conservative Muslims. Um, so that's sort of the framework that I think is very useful for understanding a lot of contemporary debates. And it's useful for understanding, too, how a lot of liberals perceive those debates. And it's not that... Um, I don't think that most contemporary liberals consciously think to themselves, okay, we are you know, literally in the place of that Protestant minister in the 1850s regarding Mormon polygamy and you know, intending to stamp it out. But I do think that there's a sense, there's a, there, there's a sense in elite America especially um, that what happened with Mormonism and Catholicism, the story I just tried to tell where both communities sort of adapted in different ways in order to fit themselves in to that older Protestant consensus, that that story can just happen again with today's religious and social conservatives, basically. That just as Mormonism adapted to 19th century America's hostility to polygamy, and just as Catholicism adapted to 19th century America's wariness about Catholicism's doubts about religious liberty. Just as Catholicism got on board with religious liberty and just as Mormonism got on board with bourgeois monogamy, not that there's anything wrong with bourgeois monogamy, um, in, in the same way, today's religious conservatives will get on board with the sexual revolution and basically adapt themselves um, to the new consensus. And that this will mean in the long run that they will accept same-sex marriage, that they will accept some form of abortion rights, that they will accept all of the developments surrounding sort of gender fluidity and, uh, I mean, basically every, every aspect of the sexual revolution that's controversial today, in this view, will eventually cease to be controversial because the religious traditions that are currently hostile to those developments will eventually get on board with them. And this is why I think in debates about you know, in debates about religious liberty, you often see the perspective of religious conservatives put into scare quotes, right? You have newspaper headlines that will say, conservatives push for, quote, religious liberty, right? This is very exasperating to conservatives. Um, but what it reflects, I think, is this sense among more liberal Americans that they aren't hostile to religious liberty. They aren't actually, they aren't anti-Catholic. They aren't anti-evangelical. They aren't anti-Mormon. You know, if they expect, you know, Catholic schools to change in various ways, if they expect Catholic institutions to change in various ways, if they expect Catholic hospitals to change in various ways, they're just essentially doing Catholics a favor, right? Because it's, because it's for the best. Um, just as it was for the best, that Catholicism adapted to religious liberty, just as it was for the best that Mormons jettisoned polygamy, just as it will be for the best that Islam changes in various ways to adapt to modern liberal democratic norms. In the same way, it will be for the best for everybody once these conservative religious traditions accept 
that we have a new consensus, that that consensus is better than the old consensus, uh, more humane, more generous, more liberal in the best sense of the word. And once these religious traditions accept that their view needs to go, basically, that they need to have some kind of new revelation, in a sense, that allows them to be okay with same-sex marriage, that allows them to be okay with the sexual revolution and all its works. Um, and so that, that attitude, I think, underlies a lot of the pressure that is already being put on religious conservatives and on conservative religious institutions, and that will be placed on them, I think, increasingly in the future. So if you look at some of the, you know, the religious liberty debates that we've had in states like Indiana, North Carolina, Georgia, and so on, where measures are passed that are intended to protect the conscience rights of religious groups, um, after they're passed, there's some sort of huge corporate uproar. Corporate America threatens to boycott the state. Fortune, the Fortune 500 companies basically say these states are participating in bigotry. We're not going to stand for it. And you know, in, in many cases, the law ends up getting vetoed or gutted and so on, and the legislature backs down, not in every case. Um, what's happening there, it's not that these Fortune 500 companies see themselves as in any way hostile to religious liberty writ large. If you told them that, they'd stare at you blankly. It's not that they're filled with anti-Catholic or anti-evangelical um, people or forces in any way. It's that they just think that this is a particular issue where the consensus has changed and religious groups need to accept the new consensus. And if you, in terms of the history of religious liberty in America, it's important to stress that's not a crazy idea. It's not an entirely unreasonable idea. Religious groups, my own included, many of yours included, ha really have changed to adapt themselves to the American consensus in the past, and it isn't crazy for contemporary liberals to expect that the same thing will happen around issues of sexual morality in the medium or near future. Um, and again, this doesn't mean that there aren't people involved in these fights on the political and secular left who aren't actually anti-religious. There are, right? They, those people exist. I've met them. I'm friends with a few of them. They're out there. Um, but the reason, the reason that the, the sort of political wind is at the back of liberalism on these issues is that lots of people who don't see themselves as anti-religious or anti-Christian, lots of people who may be, in fact, practicing Christians themselves, look at these debates and these controversies and say, what's the big deal? You know, in 50 years, we'll all look back and we'll say, you know what, the liberals were right, the conservatives needed to change, and they did, and they'll be fine, they'll be flourishing. Just like Mormonism jettisoned polygamy, and Mormonism 100 years later is doing just great. Catholicism changed completely at the Second Vatican Council, and 50 years later, Catholicism is doing well, maybe that's a bad example. <laughs> but still, Catholicism is here, it's flourishing, it's doing okay, right? Um, so that, I think, is, that's, that's sort of the, the framework that I often use when I'm, when I'm talking about these issues to more religious audiences that feel sort of besieged by trends in the contemporary culture. And it's an explanation that doesn't necessarily make them feel better about being besieged, but hopefully makes them feel clearer about what their critics and foes and the people putting pressure on them are thinking and what they ultimately expect. Um, and frankly, it, it's not just a, that this expectation is, seems reasonable to people given the history of religious trends in the US, it's that it seems reasonable to people given current developments within all of these faith traditions. Um, and, you know, this is perhaps more pronounced in Catholicism right now because my church has been having a lot of very open and noisy debates under Pope Francis about exactly these issues. But, uh, you know, if you, if you spend a lot of time in American evangelicalism and you spend a lot of time with younger evangelicals, certainly you'll find lots of people who expect that over a long time horizon, American evangelicalism will change on issues related to sexual morality in much the way that mainline Protestant churches have already changed. And if you spend time with younger Mormons, you will find, you know, at least some support 
Um, not as much support as there are is among younger Catholics, I would hazard, but some support at least for the idea that Mormonism too will end up evolving on these issues and that in 40 or 50 years time or maybe even sooner um, that there will be some sort of accommodation that blesses same-sex couples and so on in the Mormon church. Um, and you know, Mormonism has a, has a very clear history of change on some of these issues and it seems reasonable to at least some Mormons that it could change and evolve again. So given that all of these faith communities are in different ways having these internal arguments, if you're standing outside these communities as a you know, religious liberal or secular liberal, and you look inside, you say, well, look, yeah, this is, this, is what I would, this is what you'd expect to happen. They'll have these arguments the same way Mormons had arguments about polygamy and Catholics had arguments about religious liberty issues, and eventually the liberalizing side will win because the arc of history is long, but it always bends towards liberalism, and then there'll be some sort of you know, strange conservative sects that go off and do their own thing, but for the most part, this battle will be won and everyone will look back and say it wasn't that big, de big a deal and it was a good thing that all this pressure was placed on these institutions to change. Um, so that's sort of where we are right now and it's why I think the 19th century is a useful template for thinking about sort of the, the religious liberty debates that we're having and that we're likely to continue to have in all kinds of large and small ways across the next 20 or 30 years or 40 years. Um, the question is, <clears throat> how might this be different, right? Is it possible that the sort of what I'm calling the liberal perspective is wrong? Um, and if it is wrong, what happens? So if it, it, first of all, if it's wrong, that would need to be proven by, basically by the religious groups themselves. And this is why, in certain ways, the future of the religious liberty debate, e even though so much of the pressure is coming from a largely secular, bureaucratic, judicial, corporate America, and so on, e even though all that pressure is coming from sort of outside churches and outside religious communities, in the deepest sense, the future of the religious liberty debate is in the hands of the believers themselves, right? And it's the outcome of the debates within evangelicalism, within Catholicism, within Mormonism, within Judaism, within every religious tradition in America that will determine whether we look back in 50 or 100 years and say, well, I guess Catholicism turned out to be a lot more flexible on homosexuality than anyone would have thought possible. I guess Mormonism turned out to be a whole lot more flexible on you know, human sexuality issues writ large than anyone expected. That it's, it's what happens in these internal debates that matters most. Because the more the conservative perspective seems to be marginalized, or seems on its way to being marginalized, the easier it will become for political and legal forces outside those churches to sort of press their advantage and basically say, look, what's happening is what we expected to happen. You're having these internal divisions and fragmentations, and we should push harder in order to isolate the conservatives even further, and help the liberalizers. But on the other hand, if the conservative side ends up being more resilient, if the conservative side ends up sort of proving that the biblical view of sexual ethics isn't going to actually go away, that, um, that you aren't actually going to have a Catholicism or an LDS church or a Southern Baptist convention in 50 years that's basically accepted the sexual consensus that came in with the sexual revolution. If that happens, then the political fight gets tougher and nastier and ends up seeming sort of more pointless, I think, to a lot of the groups engaged in it. You end up with a situation where, it's, you know, if you're fighting about the, well, l let me put it this way. It makes a big difference whether you're having a fight about the tax exempt status of Notre Dame, um, BYU, and Baylor versus whether you're having a debate about the tax-exempt status of a few small religious colleges that no one's ever heard of, right? So if the future, if basically you have a future in which there is a sort of internal resilience to the conservative view of sexual ethics such that major religious institutions, 
are are essentially willing to sort of fight sustained battles, then you're more likely to basically have, you know, but both to have forces in politics and government and law not see the battles as worth fighting, and also have sort of average middle of the road Americans see the battles as sort of pointless. Like, why are you, you know, why are you trying to force Notre Dame to have gender neutral bathrooms? Let's say, is that really a, is that really a fight we need to be having right now? Maybe not, but. If the if those religious if those major high profile religious institutions are themselves divided and are themselves making concessions right and left, and it's only the small religious schools that nobody's heard of that are sort of fighting these battles, as sometimes has happened in the battles to date, then it becomes easier for people to say, well, look, it's just this. It's not all Catholics. It's just this tiny minority of weirdo Catholics. My dear friends, who are you know who, who are who are sort of holding out, and uh, you know it's it's okay to deny them tax exempt status, just like it was okay to deny Bob Jones University tax exempt status. It's just this you know group of Mormons. It's not you know it's not the entire Mormon community, and so on. So the extent to which though that fragmentation happens, or the to the extent to which it doesn't, will partially determine the trajectory of. The trajectory of these of these debates and whether they do actually play out sort of in a way that echoes what happened in the 19th and early 20th century, um, and then but then the other thing and that that is different is that American society is itself a more secularized society than America was in the late 19th century, right? And that what that means is that a sort of constant low-level struggle um, over these issues has the potential to do more damage to the American social fabric than did the struggle over Mormon polygamy in the 19th century. Uh, because you basically have a landscape in which religion writ large is weaker, um, in which sort of, sort of religious institutions are weaker, fewer people go to church, Fewer people are involved in religious charities. Fewer people are involved in religious organizations, and so on. And all of this, in certain ways, strengthens the hand of the people who are trying to basically push for deep systemic change, right? Because all these institutions are weaker socially, they're also weaker politically. But it also means that when you push, some of these institutions are more likely to just crumble in certain ways, which... I like to think that more liberal Americans would be able to lo look at that possibility and basically see a reason to sort of pull back, to say, well, it's not worth it to engage in what amounts to a kind of extended war against a huge and important part of American civil society in order to win further gains when we've already basically swept the cultural landscape. Um, now, I'm not at all confident <laughs> that that people that people will actually internalize that logic, but I do think that there is there is at least some palpable sense um, at the upper levels of American life of just how fragmented and uh, sort of fraying the American social fabric is for middle, lower middle class, and poor Americans, and there is at least some sense of how that's connected to the decline of religious institutions the decline of church going, um, and the decline of the sort of sense of social belonging that is bound up, bound up in all those things. And I, I, I like to say that you, know, you could imagine an alternate version of the United States, an alternate version of the contemporary landscape, where instead of basically, instead of sort of elite America spending a lot of time worrying about the, you know, the, the, the problems inherent in conservative Catholic sexual morality, the problems inherent in sort of biblical sexual morality. Instead, elite America would be sending fleets of experts out to Utah to basically try and figure out what Mormons are doing right and how that could be operationalized on a mass scale. Because the reality is that if you look at sort of all, all of the things that contemporary American liberalism is most concerned with, issues of inequality and upward mobility and the successful assimilation of immigrants and so on, that 
Utah and what you might call sort of the greater Mormon region in the U.S. is doing far better than almost any other part of the U.S. It's also the part of the U.S. that's been most resistant to Donald Trump, which is not, not those two things are not unconnected. Um, but but that, that, is a, that is a core reality of contemporary life, that, of contemporary American life, that um, religion is in decline in the U.S., but where religion is resilient and flourishing, that those are usually places where the American social fabric is still resilient and flourishing. And so my hope for the future of the religious liberty debate is that that reality and the implications of that reality will prevent the sort of low-level warfare that we're seeing now from turning into a kind of epic religious institution breaking or destroying conflict that basically the people who lead and run America will look at the good that American religion clearly does and the good that conservative religion especially very clearly does and essentially stay their hand from some of the conflicts that they've already started and that I fear they're about to sort of push a little further. Um, but I'm by no means confident that that is actually the future that we'll have. And I think it's entirely possible that we're living, we're living through a strange era in which essentially all religious conservatives are the new Mormons. And the treatment that was meted out to Mormons in the 19th century is a more violent but possibly relevant prologue to what is to come. So I'll end there. Thank you very much.